his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him oh god before the mountains were brought forth or did We dwell beneath the stars in ancient skies A thousand years are nothing in your sight From everlasting you are God And all our So satisfied
for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bonds away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose. today. Uh, what a great, great day to be here. Thank you, worship team, for starting us off. And uh, again, what a wonderful time we've had so far this morning. I uh, see many new faces today, and we are so glad that you're here at Christ Fellowship. And so I want to give two encouragements to you. Uh, one, if this is your first time, go to our welcome desk after the service. Uh, Laura Junkmas is there, and we would love just to connect with you. If you don't go to a church and this is one of your first times, we, we are so glad that you are here, and we would love to, again, be able to make contact with you. So please head out there afterwards, and again, we've got a gift for you and would love to touch base with you. The other encouragement, and this is true for everybody as well, um, all the information for our church, so all the events that we have, all the Bible studies, all the opportunities that we have are in three different locations, but it's all the same information. We have our bulletins, we've got our church website, ChristFellowshipEverson.com, and we've also got our touch screen out in the foyer. So hopefully between one of those modes, um, you're able to figure out, again, here's what's happening every day here at Christ Fellowship, and you're able to get plugged in and connected. Uh, ladies, we have our Bible studies resuming here soon. All that information is there, so highly encourage you. Take a look at that and uh, be informed, and we're just so excited for what God has been doing and will be doing. Um, all of our kids, uh, this is specific to you, okay, so big ears. After the service, okay, if you are a child all the way up through the end of jam age, we have a gift for you afterwards. So there's gift bags on your way out. Go and grab one, and uh, that's just an Easter gift, a way to bless you, and we're excited to be able to do that. So make sure and do that on your way out. All right, I would invite you, stand one more time with me. I'm going to read our passage for call to worship this morning, and uh, it is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 22 through 24. Acts chapter 2, verse 22, this is what the word of God says. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified 
and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Would you pray with me? Uh, God, we thank you so much that we get to be here together, that we get to enjoy fellowship, that we get to enjoy just a wonderful breakfast as we just had, uh, that we get to enjoy sunshine today. Uh, But above all of those things, what we enjoy, what we celebrate, what we rejoice in is that our Savior is alive, that he died a death we could not have died. It would not have been sufficient. It would not have accomplished anything But your son Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins, and yet he did not stay dead. He rose again. And so today we we thank you, Father, for sending your son. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you that today is a day that we celebrate. We don't mourn because we know your son Jesus is alive. So would you bless our time today? Would you help today bring glory to yourself as we sing, as we open your word, as we revel in who Jesus is and what he has done for us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Christ in power, resurrected. 
resurrected as we will be when he comes first corinthians 15 it says but in fact christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for as by a man came death by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Christ, risen from the dead, he now reigns victorious, his kingdom knows no end. Through his resurrection, death has lost its hold. I know on that final day, I'll rise as Jesus rose. On that day, we will see you shining brighter than the sun on that day we will know you as we lift our voice as one till that day we will praise you for your never-ending grace and we will keep on singing on that glorious day What a blessed hope, though now tired and worn, we will spend eternity around our Savior's throne. Though we grieve our losses, we grieve not in vain, for we know our crown with glory waits beyond the grave. On that day, we will see you. Keep on singing on that glorious day. 
we will keep on singing on that glorious day. Father, our hearts are filled with joy because of the hope that we have in your Son who has been raised from the dead. It was only a few hours ago that many of us were here on Friday evening remembering the death of your Son, remembering all that he undertook, all for the glory of God and for the benefit of everyone who would ever believe, all his suffering, all that he endured during his earthly ministry as he went all the way to the cross and died that horrible death. And now today we're back, ready to worship because we're filled with with this joy, this hope because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, thank you for the sacrifice that you undertook for the people of God. Thank you for your obedience to the will of the Father from all eternity. And now we come ready to continue this service together, to rejoice, to celebrate. May this be a defining moment for someone in this room, more than just one, may many hear the gospel and respond favorably to the, to the wondrous message. Lord, thank you so much for the riches that we can enjoy in Christ on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to The fifth book in the New Testament, that is the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, um, we do have some in the back. Feel free to grab one of those. Or uh, many of the verses that we'll be looking at in Acts chapter 10 are printed in the notes which are included in the bulletin. In the era of the 140-character tweet... And if you're interested, that ran from 2006 to 2017. A well-known Christian leader was asked the following question. What would be your capstone and final tweet to the world? Here's his response. Jesus, God's son, died in the place of sinners and rose so that all who love him supremely might be forgiven all and have eternal joy with God. I'm curious, if you were posed that question and you had the limits of 140 characters to send out your final tweet, what would be your last message to the world? This is quite an exercise. Would you leave a message about politics? Would you leave a message about the latest Super Bowl or World Series or Writer's Cup? Would you leave a message about your pet? Or, in some of your cases, pets? Would you leave a message about philosophy? Or perhaps some of you would be on the verge of leaving a message that says something about a cultural hot button that you are passionate about, like climate control or world peace or any number of things that find residence in your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ had this unique way to to cut through the fog and and he had this ability to help his disciples and all of us understand a very important lesson. Listen to what he says. He says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. In other words, the most important things in our lives are matters of the heart. Which really leads me to pose some very, very personal and probing questions. What drives you? Like, what was it that that woke you up this morning? What are your greatest loves? What are the the non-negotiables in your life? What defines your life? 
And one of my all-time favorite questions, and it's one that I would encourage you not only to ponder now, but to ponder in the days to come. Just what exactly are you willing to die for? You know, I can tell you, some of you know that I love politics. I've followed politics as long as I can remember, but I can't think of one political candidate that I'm ready to die for. Anyone with me? <laughs> that, that sounds kind of strange. Huh? I'm not willing to die for a politician. I hope you're not willing to die for a politician. What is it that you are, are willing to, to lay your life on the line for? All of these things that we're discussing, you see, are matters of the heart. The 18th century pastor and theologian Jonathan Edwards really helps to to expose and to lay bare what is truly taking place in our hearts. Here's what Edwards says. He says, true religion or holiness of heart lies very much in the affection of the heart. That the scriptures place the sin of the heart very much in the hardness of the heart. I must tell you that I'm just so excited to see you all here. Uh, frankly, I think this is the biggest crowd we have had in years. And so we're so glad that you're here. If you're a guest here today, we're especially glad that you're here. And as we gather on this Easter Sunday, this, this pivotal Sunday in the Christian calendar, I want to challenge every one of you, every boy, every girl, every man and woman, no matter what age you are, what, what background you're, you're from, what your ethnicity is, this is for everyone. What is the condition of your heart? Now, I've done this over the years many times, and so this will be familiar to some of you. I'm not asking what is the condition of your wife's heart, men. I'm not asking what's the condition of your husband's heart, ladies. I'm not asking what is the condition of your children's heart, or your uncle, or your aunt, or your grandpa, or your grandma, or that politician. I think we know the answer to that question. <laughs> I'm asking what is the condition of your heart, where you're seated right now. I'm sure that many of you are, are, are well aware of a product that has become popular over the last few were, years, and it, it's been advertised on TV quite a bit. It's a product called Cardia Mobile. How many of you are familiar with Cardia Mobile? Great, two of you. <laughs> Cardia, <laughs> Cardia Mobile is uh, actually, it, it, it looks just like this. It's like a credit card. I think you can buy one for under $100 and they will mail you this little device and then you link it to your smartphone and you literally put two fingers on this little card and that card has the ability to tell you what your heart is doing. It is a personal EKG device. You place two fingers on this device, and in a matter of second, you not only get an accurate record of your heart, it will even, this blows me away, it will detect atrial fibrillation, among other things. I remember when I was in my early 30s, I had some chest pain, and I was a, a, a member of Rotary Club in those days, and it just so happened that someone came to give a presentation on the heart. And I vividly remember this day. I sat down at this round table with a group of businessmen, and I remember looking at the, this little flyer, and it said, if you break out in sweat, if you have chest pains, if you have all these different symptoms, all of which I had, go to the doctor as soon as possible. And so I did, and they took an EKG. So it took time, it took money, I was scared to death. I wish they would have had this in those days. I could have put my fingers on this little credit card device. This morning when I ask you, what is the condition of your heart? I'm not referring to an EKG. I'm not referring to your resting heart rate. And I'm not even really concerned with your cholesterol levels. And while the condition of your physical heart is a very, very important question, there's another question that is even more important. 
And the question is this, what is the condition of your spiritual heart? Where do you stand with the living God? And this, this question is designed to probe deeply into the essence of who you are. There's an example of a man in the Old Testament. His name is Zedekiah. And I want to read a verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And you get an idea of the heart of Zedekiah. It says that he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. I ask, is your heart cold and stony and recalcitrant like Zedekiah? Is your heart unable to hear the simple truth of God's word and even respond to the truth of God's word in such a way that would change your life? You see, there are other things that we could be doing right now. I'm sure you're aware of this. There are so many things that we could be doing on a beautiful day, but we are here to not only worship, we are not only here to remember a risen Savior by the name of Jesus Christ, we are also here for heart transformation. Some of you, I believe, have come for heart surgery. And let me assure you, the heart surgery that you can receive at Christ Fellowship comes at no cost. You need no insurance. You don't even need any doctors. You don't need nurses. All you need is a Savior, and His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, is your heart soft and receptive to hearing the truth of God's infallible Word? Acts chapter 10, where we'll spend some time this morning, tells a story about a gentleman named Cornelius. Cornelius lived in the ancient city of Caesarea. Cornelius was a, a centurion. He was a soldier. He was a, a Roman officer in charge of 100 other soldiers in the Italian regiment, which actually consisted of 600 soldiers. That is to say, Cornelius was quite a guy. He was a very important man. And what's interesting in Acts chapter 10 is Cornelius is described as a man who prayed continually. So I want you to add these up in your mind. He's a military man. He's a soldier. He's a leader. He, he, has, he has charge over, over hundreds of men. He prays to God continually. And he is also described as a man who feared God and gave generously to other people. His friends in Acts 10.22 describe him as a man who is upright. And so Cornelius has an impeccable resume. And as the story continues, Cornelius is visited by an angel from God who instructs him to send a team of men to Joppa, the city of Joppa, and to bring a man by the name of Simon. You know him as Peter. And so these men embark on a journey and they inquire about the whereabouts of Peter. Meanwhile, and by the way, and my wife knows this about me, I'm one of those guys when you watch a movie, have you ever seen a movie where they have a scene here, it's in 1994, and there's a scene here, it's in 2012, and it's a scene here, it's in 1876? How many of you are like me? I can't stand those kind of movies. Like, just show us the movie, right? Quit moving from scene to scene. My brain can't handle it. Well, that's what's happening here. So while these men are on their way to, to track down Peter, meanwhile, in another city, the Holy Spirit tells Peter, quote, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Peter met with the men and he inquires the reason for their visit. Here's what they say. Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say. So Peter says, I would like to meet with them. So the next day he arose and 
he went away with these men and some other brothers accompanied him. And so the story unfolds. On the following day, they entered Caesarea where Cornelius resides. Cornelius was expecting them and he called together his relatives and his close friends and Cornelius now explains face to face with Peter the reason for the visit. He says, four days ago about this hour I was praying in my house at the ninth hour and behold a man stood before me in bright clothing, an angel, and he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So, saying to Peter, I went for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Before we look at our passage, I want to look at three observations about Cornelius. Number one, this is a man who had a soft heart. This is a man who was open and receptive and ready and willing to hear what God had to say through Peter. Second, this man was humble enough to open himself up to the ministry of Peter, who, by the way, was a Jewish man. And then finally, and most importantly, the posture of Cornelius, this very important man, the posture of Cornelius places him in a position to be transformed, to be revolutionized by the living God. Now, all of this backstory brings us back to our original question. What is the condition of your spiritual heart? Are you ready and willing to receive what God has for you today? Are you a humble person like Cornelius, ready to say, God, what is it that you want me to know and what you want me to hear? The title of the message today is The Most Important Message in the World. And I want to have you stand with me as we read this passage in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 34. This is the word of the living and the true God. So Peter opened his mouth and he said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right and acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, we want to come now with hearts that are ready to receive the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that we would Uh, be very much like this man Cornelius, coming with humility, with hearts that are, are ready to act and ready to obey as we hear your word as it unfolds. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I must tell you that I am personally struck and actually riveted by what I'm calling the posture of Cornelius in this story as he, as he readies himself to hear the message of Peter, a man who he has not yet met. But now as he is face to face with Peter, I love Acts 10.33, if you look one verse prior to where we just read. 
He says, now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Now put yourself in Cornelius' shoes. What do you think he's anticipating? After all, it was an angel that came and said, hey, Cornelius, track down Peter. He has a message for you. Little did he know it would be the most important message he would ever hear. I'm using my imagination. What was it that Cornelius, this virtuous, prayerful, God-fearing, upright man, what did he anticipate? Would Peter tell him, you should be more religious? Or would Peter tell him, you should be more devout or you should live more of a virtuous life? You need to do more good works or you need to pray more. The most important message in the world, frankly, wouldn't be about any of those things. And Cornelius is in for the shock of his life. Look at verses 34 and 35. So Peter opened his mouth. By the way, Christ followers, this is step one. I talk to people all the time who say, when it comes time to bear witness, when it comes time to share the gospel, it's just like, I don't know what to do. Step one, someone help me. Open your mouth. Raise your hand if you can do that. That's all it takes. Open your mouth. So Peter opened his mouth and he said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right and acceptable to him, one commentator responds to Peter's words. He says this, these words of Peter were revolutionary. Now, to the the Western mind in 2024, you might say, revolutionary? Put yourself in the first century context. These words, according to this theologian, says... They swept away the prejudice and indoctrination of generations of Judaism. Here Peter stated that God's program, imagine, was reaching out to the world through the church. Not just the Jews, because up to this point in redemptive history, the gospel was for one people group, Jewish people. The Gentiles were not party to this message or this gospel. Now Peter is opening up God's program to all peoples through the church. He's opening the door for for Gentiles like you and I to, to receive the gospel. And so here's the principle. God is so beautiful. God does not show partiality across ethnic lines. Aren't you glad about that? He doesn't show partiality across ethnic lines. He accepts all people. He accepts you and you and you and you and you in the back and you in the balcony. He accepts all of us. It doesn't matter what our background is, what our skin color is, what our social economic status, whatever that is. It doesn't matter about any of those things. God accepts us all. And so for a religious man, and by the way, I put that in air quotes, for a religious man like Cornelius, this must have been a breath of fresh air. After all, as I've already indicated, he was a man of great prayer. He was a man of piety. He is a man who feared God. Brace yourself because this is going to be a shocker for some of you. Even though he was all of those things, you must know this about Cornelius. He did not know God personally. You say, are you serious? He was a man of prayer. He was devout. He feared God. He was known by his friends as upright, yet he did not know God personally. He did not know God in a saving way. Therefore, he needed to know something else. He needed more than mere acceptance from God. Here's what he needed, and this is what some of you need today as well. He needed someone to atone for his sins. He needed someone to forgive him of all his sins. And what he would hear next would all be centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. He was about to hear the summary of the gospel message, what I'm calling the most important message in all the world. Is it any wonder that the angel came 
to this important military man and said, go find Peter. He's going to tell you something that will revolutionize your life. So there are seven critical components I want to focus on in our remaining time together, all revolving around the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus' message, don't miss this, is good news. Jesus' message is good news. Verse 36, as for the word that he sent Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. I love this little phrase, preaching good news. It comes from a a very important Greek term that simply means to, to convey the gospel. It means to bring the good news concerning Jesus' way of salvation by his death and resurrection. Let me illustrate with two other verses. 1 Peter chapter 125 says, But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word of the good news that was preached to you. That comes from the same Greek word. Also in Matthew 11, 5, we read, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Same Greek word. Notice also in verse 36, this is a message not only of good news, this is a message of peace, which as we spoke about briefly on Friday night, we live in a divided world, amen? I mean, people are fighting against each other. Liberals fighting conservatives. Different ethnic groups fighting other ethnic groups. People are at each other's throat. And so we can say at a base level, we need peace in our world. But we not only need peace with one another on a horizontal level, we all need peace vertically with a holy God. We need peace with God. The Bible says that we are born into this world as sinners. We are enemies of God in an unconverted state. Romans chapter 5 says it like this, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so Jesus' message is what? It's good news. Thank you, Edith. Jesus' message is good news. But as good as it is, I believe that This little phrase, good news, may be the most understated phrase in the English language. Good news. For when you consider where we stand apart from grace in a sinful state, the gospel is more than merely good news. It is the best news we could ever hope to receive. This is the most important message in all the world. And so Jesus' message is good news. Second, I want you to see that Jesus is the sovereign Lord of the universe. And don't skip over in verse 36. And it's so interesting, is bracketed, we have this little phrase, He is Lord of all. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read sentences like this, I have this habit of skipping over those little phrases. And we don't want to make that mistake here. We need to know that Jesus is the sovereign Lord of the universe. That word Lord comes from the Greek term kurios, which means one who has authority over others. Kurios means master of the world. Jesus, Yeshua, is master of the universe. He is Lord of all. I want you to see that that Jesus is sovereign in creation. Paul says in Colossians 1, for by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, Jesus, and for him, Jesus, and he, Jesus, is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. Revelation 4, 11. It says, worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Listen, for you created all things. Who created all things? Oh, who said that? You are right. 
light bells. Jesus created all things. And so we talk about at Christ Fellowship a lot about having a high Christology. So we acknowledge that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He's born of the Virgin Mary. He is the one who lived the life that we can never live, and he died the death that we all deserve to die. We love this Jesus who was gentle and lowly in heart, but we also know this, that babe in the manger, Jesus, he is the one who is responsible for creating all things. We have a high Christology. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we all exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist, which tells us once again, He made it all. One writer helps us to bring some perspective to this issue. How many of you like science? The first row loves science. The second row loves science. The rest of them, okay. I'll come talk to the... Are you ready? The sun, where's the sun? Usually in Whatcom County, it's like, I have no idea. <laughs> Today, the sun's up there, right? The sun has a diameter of 864,000 miles and could hold 1.3 million planets the size of Earth inside it. Can I throw in my words for a minute? Ethan, okay. The sun's really big. Okay. <laughs> The star Betelgeuse, however, has a diameter of 100 million miles, which is larger than the Earth's orbit around the sun. It takes sunlight traveling at 186,000 miles per second, about 8.5 minutes to reach Earth. Everyone okay? And, and anyone need a Tylenol? Yet, that same light would take more than four years to reach the nearest star. Astronomers estimate that there are millions or even billions of galaxies. What they can see leads them to estimate the number of stars in the universe at 10 to the 25th power. Now, if you haven't come to the point in math where you know what that means, just go home and ask your mother. She will explain it to you. But don't ask me. That's roughly the number of all the grains of sand on all the world's beaches. Why do I show you that story? Because the second member of the Trinity created it all. How many of you have a Christology that just got bigger? Jesus is massive. Jesus is glorious. Jesus is sovereign in creation. He's not only sovereign in creation, he's sovereign over creation. Listen to the, the book of Psalms. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunder of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Jesus is sovereign over nature. He is sovereign over history. He is sovereign over individuals. He is sovereign over every human decision. And finally, Jesus is sovereign over salvation. Finally, I want you to see Jesus is sovereign over all. Stephen Charnock, one of the Puritan writers, says it like this. The dominion of God is manifest in appointing to every man his calling and station in the world. Don't laugh at this next statement, okay? First row again. Raise your hand. Say, I promise not to laugh. Okay, good. If the hairs of every man's head... I should have had them raise their hands, right? <laughs> if the hairs of every man's head falls under the sovereign care 
the calling of every man wherein he is to glorify God and serve his generation which is of greater concern than the hairs of his head fall under his dominion. You see, Jesus is in control of everything. He's the sovereign Lord of the universe. Now go back to Acts chapter 10, verse 36. And if you have a highlighter, would you do me a favor and highlight that, that little phrase in brackets, he is Lord of all. Number three, Jesus lived a life that glorified God the Father. Verses 37 and 38. Peter says, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He, Jesus, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. What did we learn here? We learned that Jesus was anointed by God the Father for his earthly ministry, that he was empowered by the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, that he, listen, sets the captives free. If you're here today and you're not yet a Christian, this is what Jesus has for you. He will set the captive free. He will deliver you from all of your sin. Not only the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. And since Jesus glorified God in every way, he was qualified as the God-man to stand in our place and bear the weight of all our sin. The Bible says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Number four, the fourth critical matter concerning this message. Jesus died on a cross for sinners. Verse 39, and we are all witnesses to all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. One of my friends brought her daughter up just during breakfast, said, tell Pastor Dave what you learned is so beautiful. Jesus died on the cross. You know, moms and dads, are you teaching your children that Jesus died on the cross? And moms and dad, are you teaching that something happened three days later? We'll get to that in a moment. But in verse 39, when Peter says they put him to death, that word death means to, to put an end to someone. It means to, to terminate. It means to murder. Acts chapter 2, we read this earlier, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Acts chapter 3, verse 15, and you killed the author of life. We learn that Jesus has created all things. He's sovereign over all things. These wicked men killed murdered the author of life. The goal of these men was accomplished. The man Christ Jesus died a real death. And don't let, the, don't let people in the academic community confuse you. Jesus did not die a phantom death. Jesus did not fall asleep on the cross and then wake up in the grave. Here's what happened. When Jesus hung on the cross... When he cried out, it is finished, here's what happened. His heart stopped, his brain activity ceased, his organs stopped functioning, all of them. The man Christ Jesus died. He died a real death. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. John Piper says the death of Christ is the wisdom of God by which the love of God saves sinners from the wrath of God and all the while upholds and demonstrates the righteousness of God. God the Father sent Jesus Christ, the Son, to be the final payment for our sin because He loved us. Remember that song when you learn when you're a little kid? 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Isn't that a cute song? It is a cute song, but the song is filled with God-glorifying reality and truth. God the Father sent the Son because He loved us. His love is affirmed and His righteousness is upheld. My friends, this is the most important message in the world. You won't find this on Fox News. You won't find this on ABC, NBC, CBS, Newsmax, or any of the other stations. This is the most important message in the world that God shows His love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Now, contrast this great love of God with the wickedness of men who hoisted Jesus upon that cross. We learned earlier that the word death comes from the Greek word that means to murder someone, to terminate someone. But there's another meaning that might even have more significance where you sit today. The term death means one who dies who would be put out of sight forever. Forever. That was the intent of the sinful men. That was the intent of the devil. But Jesus, as you know, would not be put out of sight forever. The man Christ Jesus would only be in the grave for three days. And I want you to look down at verse 40. And I want you to see one of the most important words in the New Testament. And it might surprise you. It's the word but. I love the word but. But God raised him on the third day and made him appear. This is number five. I want you to see that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. That, that word translated as raised means to, to wake up. It means to resurrect. So when we talk about Resurrection Sunday, it comes from this word that God raised him. And something that might be new and unique for some of you, you need to understand who it was who was responsible for raising Jesus from the grave. The Bible tells us that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. That's what Acts 10.40 tells us. But Romans chapter 8 verse 11 tells us that the Spirit was involved in raising Jesus from the dead. And in John chapter 2, Jesus said to the men around him, destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. Same word translated raise in John chapter 2 as we just discovered in Acts chapter 10. So here's the point. The whole trinity is involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want you to also see in Acts 10 that this is a bodily resurrection. Jesus appeared, this text says, in verses 40 and 41. He not only appeared, but he ate and drank with his disciples. Have you ever seen a phantom eat or drink? I never have. Actually, I've never seen a phantom. Have you ever seen a spirit eat or drink? I never have, and I've never seen a spirit. But what happens? Jesus is resurrected as he has a, a real human body. He appears with the disciples. He eats and drinks with them. And we need to also see that Christ's resurrection conquered sin and death and unlocked the key for our salvation. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says that he was delivered up for our trespasses, our sins, and raised for our justification. Every human on the planet needs justification. That is to say, we need to be declared innocent in the sight of God. If you bank all your hope and future exclusively on Jesus Christ, you will be justified. As you stand before God's heavenly throne room, and the heavenly gavel hits the table, you will be proclaimed innocent, not guilty, acquitted forever and ever. The resurrection of Jesus is so important that Paul argues in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if Christ has not been raised, and let me stop and say, some people in our world are saying that Christ has not been raised. 
Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain, which means I have a big problem, but it also means you have a big problem. It means that what I'm doing right now is pointless, but it means where you're sitting right now is pointless if Christ has not been raised from the dead. Pastor Kevin DeYoung says it like this, the resurrection declares something about Jesus' work on the cross. It tells us that justice has been satisfied, satisfied, that sinners who belong to Christ have been justified. It tells us that for certain, all of our sins have been fully paid for. That's interesting because Peter's not done yet. He wants Cornelius, and you remember, this is a, a good man an upright man, a man who, who, who prays to God, a man who fears God, but he still doesn't know God. Peter tells Cornelius, number six, that Jesus is the judge of every creature. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. We all know what a judge does. A judge is one who casts judgment on the guilty. Peter says that Jesus is both the judge of the the living and the dead. That is to say, he's the judge of every single creature. Now in Acts chapter 17, Paul the apostle is in this fascinating exchange with the philosophers at Mars Hill. And he tells them this. He says, but, but now God commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And Paul is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus will judge every unrepentant sinner for refusing to regard God as trustworthy and failing to glorify the great God of the universe. Now, as a preacher of the gospel, I have the responsibility to warn sinners to flee the wrath to come. I have the responsibility of warning sinners about the one, Jesus Christ, who will judge unrepentant sinners. There are some preachers in our culture right now that are not doing that. And that's that's a horrible thing. As a preacher of the gospel, every preacher is mandated to warn sinners to flee the wrath to come. But that's not my only responsibility. I also have the privilege of telling everyone that Jesus Christ will forgive sinners. Number seven, Jesus offers eternal life for anyone who believes. Verse 43, to him and all the prophets bear witness that everyone who what? Believes in him, that is Jesus, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That little word believe means to trust in Jesus. Wash away the notion of believing in Jesus means, oh, I believe he exists. That's not what this word means. This word means that you you trust in Jesus, that you trust in the gospel that Jesus presents. Acts 16, 31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household. Now, I, I want to lay a shocking statement before you. This writer says it does no good to tell people to believe in the Lord Jesus. Some of you might say, what? Acts 16 says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Acts 10.43 says, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This writer says, it does no good to tell people to believe in the Lord Jesus. The phrase is empty. My responsibility as a preacher of the gospel and a teacher in the church is not to preserve and repeat cherished biblical sentences, but to pierce the heart with biblical truth. Let me try to do that for a moment. Do you delight in Jesus? Do you delight in him? Is Jesus Christ your greatest treasure? Not your truck, not your car, not your computer, not your anything. 
not your relationships, not your retirement plan, but is Jesus Christ your greatest treasure? Are you banking all your hope and future exclusively on Jesus, on his death, burial, and resurrection for you? As we draw near the end, I can't help but draw out some important lessons from this man, this fascinating character, Cornelius. And while the scriptures describe him as a man who was a man of prayer, a man who feared God, a man who was virtuous, as I've already indicated, he did not know God personally. He did not know God in a saving way. As an unconverted man, Cornelius came to Peter with a heart that was soft and ready to be transformed. I'm kind of curious, do you remember the response of the man who said, what would your final tweet be? His response was, Jesus, God's son, died in the place of sinners and rose so that all who love him supremely might be forgiven of all and have eternal joy in God. If you have embraced this morning the most important message in the world, you have your marching orders. That is to say, if you are a Christian, your marching orders are to preach the good news for people. Who's ready to do it? One more time. Your marching orders are to preach the good news to people. Who's ready? That means every park, every gymnasium, every classroom, every office complex, every backyard, every front yard, every living room, every kitchen. When you have a chance to tell people about Jesus, you remember what Peter did? He opened his mouth. You say, but pastor, I'm not trained. That doesn't matter. You say, but pastor, I don't have much experience. That doesn't matter. The youngest child can introduce someone to Jesus. I remember when I was probably third grade, I told my next door neighbor, Jerry Morgan, about Jesus, and he repented and believed. I didn't have any training. I didn't have any background. I think I'd memorized four verses by that point, right? I could barely read, but God gave me a, a love for my friend, and I simply opened my mouth. Here's the beauty of this story. When Cornelius heard the gospel, the context in the next unit of thought that we don't have time to discuss this morning indicates that his life was changed forever. Why? Because he had a heart that was ready and willing to receive the truth of the gospel and God did a mighty work of grace in his heart. He treasured the Lord Jesus Christ and that's how I would close our service today by asking, do you know God personally? Are you like Cornelius who is prepared to have his heart transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, the gospel is the, the most important message in the world. And my prayer, and our prayer as a church family, is that the Easter message has found residence in your heart. That the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that you bank on, the one that you live for. And know this, that Cornelius, as religious as he was, as righteous as he appeared to be, as one who feared God, he was not transformed until he banked everything on the Lord Jesus Christ, on his life, death, burial, and resurrection. I trust that the resurrection of Christ is real to you today and that the Easter message has taken hold in your heart. I want to invite the worship team to come as we close in prayer. Father, thank you for, for this wonderful day. Thank you for the hope of this passage. Thank you for this, the story of Cornelius. Lord, I anticipate there are some here who consider, consider themselves to be good people like Cornelius, to be God-fearing people, but some people may fit that mold but do not yet have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. May today be the day of salvation. Before we close with a few songs, let me just encourage you, if you have never repented of your sin and called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, would you simply call out to God and, and tell God that, that I'm a sinner, that I have violated your law and I have enjoyed violating your law for many, many years now. And now I want to come to you humbly like Cornelius. 
with a heart, a heart that is soft and ready to receive your truth. I acknowledge that Jesus Christ, the God-man, lived the life that I could never live. He died the death on the cross that I deserve to die. And that, Father, you raised him from the dead on the third day. And I place all my hope and future and trust in him and ask that you would forgive me of my sins, past, present, and future. Lord, may you be the Lord of my life. May I live for you until the day I die. We thank you for the salvation that you've granted your people. In Jesus' name, amen. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh
that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of christ in which we stand oh sing a theologian by the name of Roger Nicole. He went to be with the Lord in his 90s. And as the story is, is uh, drawing to a close, as his life draws to a close, I'm reading about how Dr. Nicole, Nicole can barely hear, he can barely see, he's very old, but his mind is sharp. And he quotes from memory, Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, to his friend that says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is a man filled with God-centered faith. Why can he be so confident days before he dies? Answer, because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. My question is, will you have the confidence that Dr. Nicole had before he breathed his last, and will you be with Dr. Nicole in heaven 
when you breathe your last. Wouldn't it be great if all of us could spend eternity together on the new earth, worshiping and enjoying God and one another for all eternity? Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for the day before us. Thank you for the, the great reality of the resurrection of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we leave, may we live in light of this great reality. Lord, may Christians open their mouths like Peter opened his mouth to share the, the timely message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen.